And the last time I checked, yeah. once you come into the reality of why you were made, you then come into the reality of how am I going to fund this purpose? If there is a dollar out there and that dollar could be used to buy, you know, a, a trafficked kid or to save a kid from trafficking, well, that dollar is going to go to the person fighting for it. And if you don't fight for it because you don't believe it's, you know, it's right to have money, when it happens, that dollar is going to kind of naturally drift to the wrong side. If you do good things with the money and you can make the money, you don't, you're being selfish. Okay, right. right. But to them, it sounds like we're not being humble. But you and me might be worth $5 million and we talk at $1 million stuff, which is actually humble because we could talk $5 million stuff. But to the person that doesn't have million dollar problems, it seems like bragging when in reality, me and you are being humble because we could have said the real number sure. being five. You you will not see a sick beg for money because in our religion, money must be earned through honest work. Wow. It is very important uh, the way that you earn money that it is earned honestly. The things I care about are integrity, optimism, willpower, yep. resilience. Yep. Those things are not measurable. But if you want to go and help people with that money, Man, what a blessing that we can be the feet and the hands of Jesus by paying for people's rent, paying, for, like I said, for cars, paying for medical bills, paying for education. But one day, in very much the same fashion, God spoke to me and says, I don't want any of that. I just want you to do things with me. That's it, man. And that's so free. So for God, because of God, and now with God. with God. Doing life God's way is hard, but doing life any other way is hard. You gotta choose your hard, family. Never short stopping, now I'm winning like I'm Jeter. Steady through the rigor, yeah, I'm getting bigger. Was fighting in them trenches, now I'm making seven figures like. Let me, let me explain something. Okay. If, uh, if United Airlines goes to, to, or Southwest Airlines buys Boeing airplanes, they go to Boeing and they put in an order for uh, 50 new 737s. And they say, by the way, what is your success rate? Like typically how many of your airplane, what percentage of your airplanes fly and stay flying? And Boeing says, yeah, you know, on a good day, we count on about 95% of our planes work, right? They're, okay. They're ridiculous. Nobody would say that. Yeah, right, right, right. The answer is 100%. They all do. I mean, yeah. you know, short of tragedy or pilot error, things happen. But planes, there's not 98% of them fly. All of them fly. Yeah. Um, you know, what bridge, you, you, you go about to build a bridge, bridge, huge, complex structure with cables and plating and ten. It's big. What percentage of bridges stand? Well, other than the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which you'll hear about when you set up in Tacoma, um, which was an unusual case in 1941, I think. They shut it off, right? They, they, they shut that off? Or... Yeah. It, it, fell, it, it fell. But uh, yeah. <laughs> other than that, 100% of bridges stand. Right. Correct. You know, uh, other than the Titanic, what percentage of ships that are built float? Yeah. All of them. Yeah. All of them. What percentage of marriages work? Ooh. 100%? Wouldn't you correct? No, of course not. not. Not even close. Yeah. How about business startups? How, what percentage of them? 90-95% yeah, fail rate in the first three years. Fail rate is very, very high. In fact, the marriage rate and the business success rate is kind of about the same. So why is it? it? Everyone thinks they know how to be married. Everyone thinks they know how to start a business. But the success rate is maybe 60%. And yet uh, nobody thinks they know how to build a bridge or build a plane. And yet the success rate is 100%. Mm -hmm. um, it's, um, it's, it's really important to understand that on physical matters, it's physical matters are really easy. easy. Things yeah. that are measurable in a lab or in an engineering workshop, very, very easy to do. Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, and again, I mean, uh, you, you, you got a, a gun and you want to work out the trajectory. Uh, what is the angle of elevation if you want it, if you want the, the shell or the, um, yeah. uh, you're, you're, you're round, you're round, round on target. You want it to, to land in a certain place. This is not hard to do. Correct. Not hard to do. Because when you're dealing with physical characteristics, uh, these things are all very easy. But as soon as you are dealing with what I call spiritual characteristics, and Matt, can I take 30 seconds here to talk about definition? Because it's really important. Please, please, please. please. Everybody gets clear yeah. definitions here. Um, spiritual has nothing to do with me being a rabbi. Spiritual has nothing to do with God. Spiritual has nothing to do with religion. Spiritual has nothing to do with piety or virtue or sin. Uh, spiritual just means something 
I cannot measure in a laboratory. Hmm. And so I, I can measure uh, the skin color of a person. I can measure the height of a person. I can measure the weight of the person. And the truth is that every one of those things are irrelevant. If I'm hiring somebody, <laughs> I really don't care about any of those things. The things I care about are integrity, optimism, willpower, yep. resilience. Yep. Those things are not measurable. So, R Rabbi, this blows my mind away because I talk to a lot of men and we encourage them to get in business for themselves. And next thing you know, to build a business, you got to get that. You got to go out there and know people. You got to increase those that know you and trust you. And next thing you know, a lot of men, they say, you know what? I'd just rather work with my hands, you know, because I, now I get it because it's so easy to deal with wrenches and it's engines. Wonderful. It's, it's, it's easy. Hand. Look, uh, whether, whether, whether you're a, uh, an auto mechanic or whether you are a surgeon, uh, it's just a, you, you're just working with different tools and, you know, the stakes are a little bit higher with the surgery, but it's basically, <laughs> it's basically all physical. Yeah. You're taking tools and you're fixing some pipes or tubes that don't work the way they ought to, the hydraulic system or the, uh, the blood, or whatever it is, that's all physical. But why is it that there are some auto mechanics or plumbers who make a fortune and others barely make a living? There are surgeons, believe it or not, there are surgeons who struggle, who are not making a lot of money, and there are others who are making a huge amount of money. And the answer is that uh, the ones who are succeeding, whether they are surgeons or mechanics, are the ones who understand the spiritual qualities as well. Uh, they learn how to market. They learn how to sell. Yes, it's true. If, if you want to work with your hands, that's great. Be a mechanic. But build up the business. Hire more people to work for you. Develop the marketing. Make Make, make sure there's always a line of people trying to get you to take care of their cars. Now, that part is the spiritual part. Wow. That is profound. That's because that requires then, which one of your habits talks about increasing your self-discipline, integrity, and character strength in achieving success, which is habit or secret number 11. Yeah, exactly right. There you go. Okay. Can I ask you then, um, then this, money's so spiritual then, does, does, if money's so spiritual, does, does God, yeah. would God, does God really want us to be rich? No. If okay. he does, if he does, he hasn't shared that with information with me. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's a little bit like, um, does God want us to have great sex? Um, uh, I, Think so because he. I'll save you. I'll save. <laughs> yes. um, again, unfortunately, the Lord has not shared that with me. <laughs> I live in hope, but um, what I do know is that the Lord does want um, one man and one woman to be utterly devoted to one another until they become like a unified entity, and it shouldn't surprise us that a good and, and loving God should reward that behavior with the greatest sensual pleasure known to human beings, which is sex. Correct. Does he want us to be rich? Unfortunately, he hasn't shared that with me, although I live in hope. But I do know that above all, he wants us to be obsessively preoccupied with taking care of one, an one another's needs and desires. And it should not surprise now, if you want to be cynical, you can call that market research, you can call it marketing, you can call it selling. But if you are obsessively preoccupied with taking care of other people's needs, why would it surprise you that a good and loving God would reward you with the incredible blessing of financial abundance? Wow. Wow. Uh, and that's why the way, by the way, that we Jews never pray to God, oh, please, God, help me find $600 that I can make the rent payment next week. Okay. We never say that. Okay. We always say, please, God, open my eyes so that I can see more of your children that need my services. The money will follow by itself. Amen. Look at that. Now I wake up and now I seek first the kingdom. I go to God because I know it doesn't matter how big my arms are. It doesn't matter how much money I have. That is not the purpose of life. 
That might be small missions that yep. God places me on okay. to go and do and accomplish and create and steward, yep. but that is not my purpose. So understand Seven Figure Squad, as you guys are watching this episode right now, understand that making money is a mission. It is not a purpose. It is a vehicle for you to live your best life, whatever that looks like. If you decide to follow the King of Kings and develop a relationship and get out of religion, get into a relationship with Jesus Christ, this is how we do it, man. Mm -hmm. But it's not easy. It's hard. This is a hard lifestyle because there are, there are structure and there is order to this. But I can promise you this, it might be hard, but it's worth it. Yes. Because I've done life the yeah. other way. And I, I know we're running a little bit low on time, but could I read one more thing? Please. So this is, a, this is a, a poem called The Habit Poem that I read to myself every single morning. And we talk about hard and we talk about making money. We talk about living our life for God. That's hard. And everything that I'm about to read to you are different examples of hard. And you get to choose as you listen to this or as you watch this, you get to choose what type of hard that you want in your life. Being your best is hard. Being normal is hard. Making wise decisions is hard. Making bad decisions is hard. Being in shape is hard. Being out of shape is hard. Losing weight is hard. Being fat is hard. Working out, it's hard. Being weak is hard. Being disciplined is hard. Being lazy is hard. Getting outside of your comfort zone, like after this video, taking action on what we talked about and going and drawing up your launching pad, that's hard. Starting a business, that's hard but working for somebody else is hard too. Making a lot of money, ask Matt. It's hard. Making a little bit of money, ask Matt. It's hard. Being rich, ask Matt. It's hard. Being poor, how's that? Oh, That's harder. hard. <laughs> Having great relationships is hard. Having bad relationships is hard. Having no friends is hard. Having friends is hard. Fighting for your marriage, men and women, mm. is hard. Oh. Divorce is hard. Having a lot of things is hard. Having nothing is hard. Living on purpose is hard. Living off of purpose is hard. Doing life God's way is hard, but doing life any other way is hard. You got to choose your hard, family. Boom. What, what would you say to our faith-based community? Because some of the biggest comments I get, you know, when I'm talking about being a faith-based millionaire, right, right then and there should not be even going in the same Right. Yeah, it's harder to get a man into heaven as it is to get a, a, sure. a man with the eye of a needle, right? Yeah. You're right, right. You know, the, the, the love of money, da, 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 all, that, all these stuff. But at the same time, too, based on the goals and the dreams and the jobs you want to create and the lifestyle we want to live, you, you, you kind of, quite frankly, you got to make a lot of money in, in this day and age, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, so what, what's your guidance and advice to our faith based community out there to, hey, it's okay to make money and it's okay to have big goals and dreams? Don't lessen. Mm -mm. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, something I read by it was Mark Manson talked about like you should never make people the means uh, to an end, right? You should make people the end and the means should be different, right? The means could be money, means could be time to get to the end of doing great for people, but don't make people the means. Don't know this person to get that connection, right? So I, I put that out in front to say essentially, like God didn't say don't make money. He did say go prosper, be wealthy, right? But it's a matter of what are you doing to get that to the end? What are the means to get to the end? And so I found that there's a great book by Lynn Twist, and it says it's about, called The Soul of Money. And the way she frames it in, in the conversation, I was having with somebody else, like kind of like this thing where it's a facilitator. And if there is a dollar out there and that dollar could be used to buy, you know, a, a trafficked kid or to save a kid from trafficking, well, that dollar is going to go to the person fighting for it. And if you don't fight for it because you don't believe it's, you know, it's right to have money, what happens that dollar is going to kind of naturally drift to the wrong side. So when I look at what I do, Someone posed a question because I was like, I don't have any money goals. You're like, well, can you make money? Yeah. What would you do if you made the money? I said, I give a good chunk to like organizations. I donate time. I donate money. They said, okay, well, if you do good things with the money and you can make the money and you don't, you're being selfish. I was wow. like, interesting. But like, because at the end of the day, if you will do good things, it's up to you to get that dollar from the wrong hands and do the good thing with the dollar. Money's a facilitator. So yes, the love of money and only money is a problem. But if you love the people and they are the end and that's a means it's the right thing to do. Yeah. You know, I, I talk about money and success, prosperity, you know, uh, oh, yeah. elevating your game you know, all the time on our YouTube channel. And one of the biggest pushbacks I get, and I've been wrestling with this word, maybe you can help me uh, understand it better, is that oftentimes I get uh, our Christians, not necessarily believers, is in your point there, you <laughs> that will right. throw scripture at us here on our YouTube channel talking about, you shouldn't go after becoming wealthy. You shouldn't come after becoming rich. You shouldn't go after, you know, uh, getting the next promotion. Just be content with whatever God gives you. 
Mm -hmm. I just can't see a Butch Harmon just being content uh, just with one, you know, project at Hanna Barbera, one project at Nickelodeon. How do you? Mm -hmm. No, well, well, first of we, all, we both have answers for that. Yeah, so I'm glad, I mean, glad you asked that. Let me tell you something. The bet, the most, the most amazing day ever is when you can give people cars, houses, or pay their rent, pay their rent, um, pay for their schooling. Mm -hmm. You see, the the problem is they're thinking about it's all for them and how many cars they can have and how many houses they can have. Mm -hmm. You know what? That's your business. You can do what you want with it. But for us, we make money to help people. Mm -hmm. And we've that when we met Jesus in uh, 1999. We, at that point, said we are going to be givers. We are going to sow like no one's ever seen before. You know, when you, when you see what someone's getting, you need to take a look at what they're giving. I always yeah. say, you know, the Bible says you reap what you sow. And you're not going to reap anything if you don't sow anything. I want to talk about real quick the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan finds him in the Bible, finds a man laying beaten on the road. There's a, there's a man who's been attacked by bandits laying on the road. Two people pass him. I think a priest and a rabbi pass him, but the Good Samaritan comes along, picks the guy up, puts him on his donkey, so he had a vehicle, gives him oil and wine, so he had medicine, takes him to an inn, so he had connections, pays for his stay at the inn, so he had money to pay, and then he says, I have to go, here's money, whatever he needs, I'm, I'm, I'm covering it, but I got to go. So, so the Good Samaritan had, a, had business to attend to, and then he came back and picked the guy up. So see, Christians need resources. If you don't have resources, you won't be able to be effective in any way at all. Yes, you can pray for people. I'm not saying you can't be effective completely, but it's the, the notion and the myth that we're not supposed to have resources or be prosperous, I find unfortunate because when you are prosperous, like Julian said, you can help other people. You're blessed to be a blessing. Yeah. And this conversation that I've stumbled across uh, lately is certain preachers or pastors get boxed in by you know, people out there on YouTube, people out in the media, talking about their prosperity preachers, their prosperity gospel. I, to me, I've, I've never really understood that because when I read the gospel, when I read the Bible, there's prosperity in there. Oh, yeah. That this is a specific, you know, line of preaching or religion, the prosperity religion, I think, that what, what people are trying to get. Through. I just think there's people out there are trying to attack. I mean, we know that, and listen, one thing that God did promise in his word that we would be persecuted. <laughs> And you know what? <laughs> Jesus yeah. guarantees that. He guarantees yeah. that. But he says, but don't worry world... about it because I've overcome the world, right? Like, <laughs> it's like, who cares? But I will tell you what's really cool is that when you are persecuted, you know that you are right in the will of God because no one's going to persecute someone that's lukewarm. Mm -hmm. Well said. Yeah. And then, you know, there, there's, it's unfortunate. There are some people that have taken advantage yeah, but in their, any, in any business, any right. Business. In any yeah. kind of, there's people that take yeah. advantage of their position and they milk people and they, they rip them off. Of course that happens everywhere. That happens in your business, right? It happens everywhere. Yeah. 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 But, but if you, but listen, when it comes to, when you say Jesus, okay, now that's a whole other You're not story. allowed to make any money yeah. at all ever. And it's like, you can't do anything, but it's like, I, you know, if, if people want to like go, well, I can't believe you make all this money. It's like, well, look, do you know how hard we work to get to a position where we could do this? You have no idea what we've gone through to get here. So that we the, can give And the away. sacrifices that we've made to get here. And then you have no idea what we've even given. We never announce our giving. We don't no. tell people what we give. We don't do anything. That, like, but trust me, we do. We have a foundation called Hartman House. We use that to help people out. We um, we help people as much as we can whenever we, yeah. whenever whenever. we, whenever we can. We have to analyze it first, see what it's all about, you know. And then we'll you know, it's interesting. Uh, a couple of years ago, we were we were mentoring a um, a couple, and they had just started a uh, ministry, mm -hmm. and so we were just you know going over you know all whatever they're going to need to start their ministry and so. And what was interesting is that we were talking the money part came into it, and I and we were talking about the prosperity side of this, and so the gentleman says, "Well, I don't need. All I need is this to get by." And I said, okay, really, that's it? Like only for you? What about all the other people that have a need that you could actually fill that need for them? And uh, he, he was like, never, he was probably 32 years old. Never heard that. Yeah. <laughs> this was wow. just a business, you know, uh, meeting where we were mentoring. He mm -hmm. goes, I never thought about that. And I said, you're telling me you've never thought about making money to help? other people he said wow. no i thought it was just for me and so yeah. what i love about it is that 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 guy's whole life changed 
because he wasn't stuck with this thing of like, I only need what I need to get by and yeah. that's all I need. And so, it, you know, what, what is, how many cars do you need? How many houses do you need? Yeah. And if you want to have 50 at each, that's your business. Absolutely. You're not asking me for a dime. It's your business. Mm -hmm. But, but if you want to go and help people with that money, Man, what a blessing that we can be the feet and the hands of Jesus by paying for people's rent, paying, for, like I said, for cars, paying for medical bills, paying for education, whatever it is paying that we clothing. can do. Clothing. One, the very first thing we ever bought for somebody, when we finally, we finally started making a little bit of money, this, this person we knew needed a plane ticket to go see their son. And we're like... Yeah. How much the plan? And she couldn't afford it. We're like, yeah. how, how much the plan yeah. take? It's like three hundred bucks. We could do that. And we and it made the, the changed this person's life that we would do that for them. And we're like, wow, we should do that again. That was really fun. And you know, honestly, <laughs> yes. you wouldn't have met two more selfish people in your life. Oh yeah. Back before we yeah. before we got saved, it was like, give what? To well, here's, who? well, here's why. Right? Here's why we were selfish. We were survivors. Yeah. We we came from homes that were very chaotic. Wow. We had no money. We had no money at all growing up. I didn't have any money. She didn't have, we had nothing. And and so like when you get, we weren't like this, like angry, selfish people. We were just like, look, man, I just got to get no, this like for this, me. This is mine. Mine. Yeah. yeah. And that's, and that's the attitude of a lot of people. And we completely understand. We get it. But uh, we, man, we open up. When you open up your heart, you open up your hands as well. And you say, listen, he says that he'll supply all your need according to his riches and glory. But, but if his people don't want to give, to, you know, whatever charities or whatever it might be. Yep. What's wrong with that picture? Yeah. Is your heart open? When you're looking at what you do today, you say, God, you know, put these things uh, around my way. So in, in your opinion, what does it take to be a person of faith, to be faith-based mm -hmm. and actually not feel any guilt of succeeding? Because, you know, you see it around the faith-based community, the Christian community. Oh, you, know, you know, it's better to be broke, man. I mean, you know, God doesn't want you to prosper and, and some financial myths that people have about finances in the church? Well, I think a lot of people are very undereducated when it comes to the Bible. And I think it's because we got a lot of people with hidden agendas preaching stuff from it that they're really not sure about. Um, I spent a lot of time in prison and spent a lot of time in solitary confinement. Therefore, I have read the Bible. Bible. <laughs> a couple times. Yes. Times, yes. Yeah, four times to be exact. Well. And since 2005, I have read the proverb of the day damn near every day, which would admit that I have read Proverbs over 200 times, I believe. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that. I love Proverbs. We, we did a series. Of, that was a video for us that blew up uh, how this book of the Bible made me millions. And yep. I got so much heat from the faith-based yep. community. Oh, you should never use the Bible to make money. God didn't save it. They misunderstand the word humble. Have you, most people have never looked up the definition of humble. Humble says of lower self inventory and value than what's actually there. So what people think is bragging to you. See, you and me, we say we make a million dollars and we feel poor because Patrick's our friend. <laughs> right, okay, right, right. But to them, it sounds like we're not being humble. But you and me might be worth five million and we talk in one million dollar stuff, which is actually humble because we could talk five million dollar stuff. Yeah. But to the person that doesn't have million dollar problems, it seems like bragging when in reality, me and you yeah. are being humble because we could have said the real number sure. being five. Yeah. And so that's where people don't understand the lord tells you to be humble or the the lord doesn't say that the bible the man writing in the bible says that that, that that's god's will is for you to be humble but it doesn't say be broke Correct. it also Correct. does it says well it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of, of a needle, needle that however what people don't understand is the eye of the needle is not what we sew with. You think people were sewing with needles back then with eyes in them? How, they didn't have machinery. How could they have made something that small, right? Most names come from something else, right? The eye of the needle was where you rode your camel through the crossing of a castle to go into a new town. Remember back in the day, oh, Jerusalem, yeah, fortified. Yeah. The okay. eye of the needle is the saying that you wrote because it was threaded your camel through there, which is actually where the eye of the needle actually comes from, which meant that it's not in impossible it's just a pain in the ass <laughs> boom and people right. don't understand that so they use these sayings not understanding the context google me i'm not wrong and and pastors say this too because they've never heard the real story of it and they don't understand this because whoever mentored them told them but listen if i ran a church do i want a broke congregation no we ain't gonna build no beautiful building for god with a broke congregation sure. i need my congregation on fire making yeah. money yes you know it doesn't make sense you think when god created us he's like you know what I want this person that, you know what? I created this in my image and I want my image to grow up and be fat 
and broke and make a bunch of excuses and be useless. That's the image I created, oh, man. It. Oh, drop it. Hell yeah. no. <laughs> hell, hell no. no. When, when you guys came over here yes, from sir. Korea, what was the motivation for your family to immigrate from Korea? Yeah. Yeah. My, so my dad's a preacher. And uh, initially, God had called him to start a church, you know, continue a church in Chicagoland area. And so it's interesting, man. So we, we got here when, when I was five years old. We were dirt poor. Anybody listening to this right now who has lived the immigrant life know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, you go to a country, you speak no English, can't get any government assistance. Yeah. And, you know, you and I are both entrepreneurs, so I guess I'll, I'll start on the topic. I've always had a very interesting facet with money because— you know, growing up, we lived in a studio apartment. Mm -hmm. You know, just my parents, my older brother, myself. Rent was three ninety. One of the first observations I met about I, I made about life was uh, my parents went to work every day. The landlord came once a month, and the reason why he came once a month was to pick up a check. So observation I made at two two a.m. I I couldn't sleep much as a kid. I was six years old. I remember looking out. And uh, I saw, we lived next to what's known as a gentleman's entertainment center. I got you. Put it nicely. I got you. And I remember. So, so an arcade, an arcade, arcade place. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. It's not a place you and I would hang out. You know, gotcha. we're both faith driven, married men, you know, but <laughs> other men, hey, you know, more, go, yeah. more power to you. Yeah, right? That's the thing. But I remember watching at 1 or 2 a.m., I'm six years old, I'm looking at these guys. They're wearing $3,000 custom suits. They're stumbling out. They're getting into their Mercedes and their BMWs and their Lexuses. And I look over, my parents are sharing a twin size bed that's also doubling as our dining room and our wow, kitchen. Wow. You know, and they love the Lord, they love God, they follow biblical principles, mm -hmm. you know, and they care for people. Yeah. And the immediate question I asked is, why? You know, my, the, and, the, and the observation- Why, why, why are you in a, in a, why? In yeah, a that's, small apartment? Exactly. Okay. That's literally just, you know what I mean? Like the, the one word that came to my mind, like why? At six years old. At six years old. It's pretty insightful for a six year old. Yeah. But it's just an observation. You know, yeah. it's just like I, my parents are super nice people. These guys, chances are, you know, maybe they're nice, maybe they're not. Yeah. I don't know. You know, but that's just an observation I made. It's like in order for you to love God and follow God, you have to hate money. That you have to be broke. You have to be poor. Yeah. And then I got a lot wiser. I realized that the most uh, God loving thing that you could do a lot of times is to start a business, is to be a creator, is to create opportunities, to be an entrepreneur. Right. So you know, Jesus loves stories. I love the story of the prodigal son. So you know, sure. long story short, younger yeah. son divorces the family, wants his inheritance, goes off to a foreign land, squanders all his money, yeah. and then comes back, and the father runs to him. You know what's an interesting part of that story that no one thinks about? I was actually driving this one time. I got a buddy of mine, former business partner, grew up in a country called Chad, Africa. Uh, it's yeah. one of the most poverty-stricken yeah. countries. Yeah. But you know what's very funny is that the the way they grew up over there, even now, they're culturally they're very similar to how Jerusalem and Israel was back when Jesus walked. Wow. A lot of the customs are very much the same way. Are there Jews in uh, in Chad? Uh, I'm not sure, but yeah. I, I a buddy of mine was a missionary, oh, so, so their family grew up as missionaries in Chad. Yeah. And he says, you know what's crazy about that story that no one talks about is that the father running to the son was arguably the most shameful thing that he could have done. Because the father running to the son. To the son was the most shame. Because in those days, especially a man of that great yeah, my son know, comes to me. Status. Yeah. The son comes to you. Yeah. Right. They have the beard. Right. And yeah. typically, the, the what's custom is they sit under the tree and they have people come to them. By having the father run to the son, he actually made himself a public skeptical spectacle. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was, yeah. a, it was actually a, a, humili a, a yeah. very much of a humiliating act. But humiliated himself to do that. He humiliated himself to do that. So the message that Jesus talks about there is that, that God in many ways is, is willing to make himself look like a fool to pursue you who just created wow. the greatest sin. So I tell people all the time, man, it's just like you, you will never, never, like God will always be a better savior than you are a sinner. Mm. doesn't matter, man. Like he will always be a better savior than you are a sinner. Gotcha. So, hey, man, I guess we, uh, that's one thing I got to step myself into then, mm -hmm. if, if that's the case. Yeah. But imagine, but to your point, like yeah. imagine if we had a world where people actually lived into that and on a it, practical day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, you don't have to be so damn perfect. Absolutely. You know? Because think about what perfection and think about what pressure prevents. It prevents intimacy. If your son has pressure to perform and be perfect in your eyes as a father, it destroys mm -hmm. honesty and destroys intimacy. My definition and, and authenticity and, and being authenticity. genuine. Yeah. yeah, my definition of intimacy, intimacy is to be made known, right? When we have this pressure to perform, we are preventing ourselves to be made known to the Father. That's it. Right. 
You know, the, fa- the father makes himself known to us. But at the end of the day, what he wants is intimacy between, between us and him. That's what we want. Yeah. You know, like I remember there was one time I was at, uh, I was at a group and we, you know, there, we, I'm not a big advocate of the traditional Bible study. You know, because at the end of the day, I believe that the father wants nothing more than to see his kids be in fellowship, be in love and serve. So, you know, we have this group where every Wednesday night we get together, you know, a bunch of buddies and I. It was actually uh, founded by my good friend, Andy Willemies, and it's called the Young Professional Forum. We, we get together and we cool. just talk about what does it mean to be authentic? What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does yeah. it mean to authentically have, you know, to love one another? Yeah. And we just get together. And I remember in the middle of our conversation, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. God spoke to me. And it was just like a knife went in through my heart. And this is what he told me. He said, Daniel, I love that you donate to all these different charities and nonprofits. I love that, you know, you're very ambitious and you're living into how I, you know, created you and how I wired you. I love that you're doing all these things and creating opportunities for other individuals through jobs. And I love that you're a loving guy and you're, you're, you're doing all these great things. I just wish sometimes we could do it together. <laughs> and that, and that killed, that, dude, that, wow. that was like a knife. You said heart. something at lunch. We had. It's, it's yeah. one thing to do big things. Do the three things you talked about. Can you can you share that on three things? That, I, I'm yeah. doing because of God. Yes. Because God. Yes. So so that that, that kind of laid into that, yeah. right? So when I was younger, I, I wanted to do things a lot of things for God. It's like oh no, I want to build hospitals. I want to build yeah. schools. I want to do it. And th- and that's and that's almost the model of my generation. Our generation is really the first generation to have social media and see all the evils that's going on around the world. You know, everything from, you know, you could say police brutality to bombings and everything. Yeah. So we want to do a lot of things for God. And when I was in college, I got a little wiser and I realized that I, I should do things because of God. Because I should be, I should be reacting to his grace. I should be reacting to, mm-hmm. to all the love that he asked for me. And I should respond and actually live into that. And then, you know, one day in, in very much the same fashion, God spoke to me and says, I don't want any of that. I just want you to do things with me. <laughs> That's it, man. And that's so free. So freeing. for God, because of God, and now with God. with God. And ultimately, that's what God wanted, you know. And, you know, it's just like the same analogy, you know. It's like, wow. you know, as, as a father for you, um, I'm sure there's nothing more than you would like for your son to just do things, want to do things with you, yeah. to want to hang out with you. Yeah. And at this point, I'm sure you don't care whether or not he does it right, whether he does it wrong. You're just happy that you guys are, are yeah. hanging out, man. Yeah. You guys are creating interesting. memories and bonds and yeah. things that will last forever. By the way, that was a profound moment right there. By the way, if you thought that was a profound moment, drop it in the comment section below. For God, because of God, yeah. and now with God. I'd love to know what your thoughts are on that. And my, <laughs> my attempt Come on, to, man. to win souls for Christ through the pocketbook, That's right. through, through their finances, because yeah. uh, this is an area that a lot of people have conflict in, and this is an area where the, the enemy loves to roam, steal, kill, and devour, uh, financially speaking. So... Um, so what are some of the what are some of the things that you realize that as you you're coming up uh, that you realize in your journey to to you know building a business yeah man. Uh, building um, you know a, 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 your financial uh, status to be able to to employ people and to to have investments back into your company the question I have is what did religion teach you that your faith disproved about that religious teaching and what did faith reveal to you this is how you should really be going about things so for me you know the number one scripture that everyone attacks right is the love of money is the root of all evil okay so when we look at that passage of scripture everyone is fearful of hey you got to be careful you cannot love money because that's evil it's bad but i'm like yo why are we so scared of a thing that is that is showing us what happens when you don't have God. <laughs> okay. When you are not in a right relationship with God, anything can happen. You can become addicted to money, addicted to pills, addicted to drugs, addicted yeah. to success, yeah. addicted to power, addicted yeah. to whatever it is. And it's just giving us shining light that out of all the things you can be addicted to, money is one of the most powerful things sure. that can draw you away from this thing, this powerful relationship with Jesus. But if you have that relationship with God mm-hmm. and you have that place where you understand his heart and yeah. you know what he desires yeah. and what he wants to see happen, there's no way for you to not be infused with purpose mm-hmm. and destiny and come into contact with the reason you were born and why you were made. And the last time I checked, yeah. once you come into the reality of why you were made, you then come into the reality of how am I going to fund this purpose? Hello. How am I going to fulfill this thing that God has called me to do yeah. when it's going to in some way and somehow involve me changing? 
changing people's lives, that I've got to be able to get access to them, mm -hmm. and I've got to be able to do have some form of resource, some form of funding, and the church has only been able to do it by way of, hey, everybody, if you believe in this mission, yeah. <laughs> He's right. if you believe in this vision, <laughs> Come on, yeah, come on, where place, you place, place, place. the place, everybody. Yeah. We got a front. building to build. Come on, we want to reach our city. We want to, come on, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that message, man, I'm sorry. We rely on the people to yeah. fund it versus our ability to go create ventures yeah. that we haven't got to ask for a dime because yeah. yeah. it's already been paid for. Yeah. So when I came into that reality, I said, we've got, I'm not knocking how it's being done, yeah. but I don't believe this is the only, only way. way. When, when, um, Sorry, I started preaching. No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. We're, we're about to get into it too. We're about to get into it too. Because you know, you in, in your um, CBN uh, interview, there's a, there's a, we'll put, we'll put that uh, uh, a picture of it right here. But in that interview, that the fi the financial situation that you're in, you lost your confidence as a man, as a provider. Yes, sir. And and thank God you, you picked the right wife. Yes, sir. Because uh, uh, many um, people that you meet on Facebook. <laughs> Yeah. End up story. being, you know, catfish, not, what they call it. <laughs> right, right. And Natasha ended up being uh, who she, she, she said real she, thing, uh, who she was. And thank God for a, uh, an amazing woman in your life. Um, but in, the, in that process, though, what was going through your mind when you're sitting in a pit of nothing and a lot of doubt, disbelief, failure was sitting in your mind? How did you process and fight through it? Well, the first thing, right, we hit the moment where when I hit that bottom pit, I had already experienced many breakthroughs. What I call it, I already had history with God. Okay. So when I hit that pit, it required me, it forced me to pull on that history. Okay. Because first thing that's going to come into question is, is God good? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. is he good or is he not? Yeah. Because I'm sitting in this moment and I'm like, God, I'm sorry, man. Like, why am I here? I've been faithfully tithing. I love my wife. Mm -hmm. I went to Bible college. I was a virgin. I began to pull on my works. <laughs> okay, okay. I began to pull on, this is what all I have done. And I was forgetting what he had done. And that, I would say, was the catalyst for the breakthrough. Jamal, don't worry about what you've done. What has he done and yeah. what can he do? Yeah. And so, man, when we were on that bottom place, it was really challenging because what I realized was I had done the very thing that I, you know, was, I guess you can say they say, don't do, which is I made money my God. And I had allowed, you know, whenever I didn't have it, yeah. and we were on food stamps, yeah. I was driving Uber, I was, you know, working a part-time job, trying yeah. to do my business, yeah. and we literally get to a point where nothing was working. Nothing was working. And it was at that point that I was like, God, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's happening. But I need like I need I need I need clarity. Like I need breakthrough. So that next Sunday morning at mm -hmm. church, mm -hmm. a pastor starts preaching, gets into an altar call, and he's like, I don't know who this is for, but see you somebody in here is struggling with the spirit of mammon. You've put God no, you've put God in the passenger seat and you've now allowed money to take drive. Uh oh. And I begin to just like, you know, you go into that moment where you yeah. go in with God and I'm hearing and I'm seeing myself like walk through the moments where I'm seeing money is determining my behavior, mm -hmm. my decisions, it's determining my mood. When we got it, we're good. When we're not, we're bad. I'm like, yo, yeah. this is really, this is it. Yeah. And then he says, hey, you need to break that. And he's like, I, I, and my pastor's not the one to do one of those, hey, give a thousand dollars right now. Yeah, yeah. He's there, I've never seen him do it. But in that moment, he was like, I'm gonna call, I'm, a, I'm challenging you right now. If this is you, you need to put God back in the driver's seat. And so a thousand dollars. At that point in my life, I had never sold that much money before. And I'm giving the dollar amount because I, I want people. It's a part of the story. How I much never, money did you, you said you had? A, what a couple grand still left in the bank? Maybe it was like yeah. maybe like eighteen hundred, two thousand dollars. <laughs> and so going to the green room, I'm really close to my pastor. Going to the green room, he, and this is first service. I didn't do yeah. it, but we got a second service. <laughs> so I go in the green room and I'm like, "Yeah, I was working on you." A thousand dollars. He's like, "You ain't never gave a thousand dollars." And I was like, "No, that's a lot of money." <laughs> and he was just like. Well, call your wife. And I call Natasha. I'm like, babe, I think this is us. Yeah. And she's like, well, babe, what's the prayer? Like, what do you believe in God for? And I, in that moment with her on the phone, I said, babe, I'm telling God, I don't want just a check in the mail. I don't want just a, a, a promotion. I don't want something that just will be temporary. I want an idea. I want something that's going to last generations. So we sold that $1,000. Yeah. And then what I heard from the Spirit of God when the moment I sowed that thousand dollars was, wow. what you just sowed as a seed will become your tithe. 
And man, life has not been the same since that moment. Wow. Because you talk about being an extravagant giver. Can you explain what being an extravagant giver is? How, you, how would you define that? To me, I would say extravagant giver is being an obedient giver and just living the lifestyle of, of, of giving. Yeah. Here's the thing that most people think. Extravagant is you having to constantly give over and above and it's all this money. Yeah. I believe, no, extravagance is consistency. Yeah. Because what it is is that most people just do it once a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or they'll do it when the big moment comes with, you know, right. with the bucket out front for Christmas time. Yeah. Versus how am I being doing this consistently? How am yeah. I doing this with extravagance to where this is becoming part of my lifestyle? To the degree, yeah. people would say, man, one day, I can't wait to buy somebody a car. Ooh, one day I can't wait to buy somebody a house. So they'll say those things, and I can't wait to be an extravagant giver. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm like, hey, you can't buy someone a house right now, but you can pay for their car note. You may not be able to buy somebody a house, I mean a car right now, but you can pay for their car note. You may not be able to buy a house right now, but you can pay for their mortgage. So that was what I did. When, in college, I would pay for people's car note. Well, guess what happened? Three, about maybe six, seven years later, I was able to buy somebody a car in cash. <laughs> what a cool feeling, right? You see what I'm saying? <laughs> but it didn't start with me yeah. starting with the car. It started yeah. with the car note. Yeah. So you can be extravagant right where you are, yeah. starting with what you have. Because I think a lot of people compare. Yes. Like externally. Like if, 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 I, if I was going to a typical you know, uh, fundraising event, you know, we have this to auction off, this to auction off. This, okay, who can I get to do 1,000? Who can I get to do 5,000? And it becomes a competition. Exactly. And it becomes about that. And then, and if, and, and if you're in a per, you know, sitting there in your person, like, okay, I can't let them outgive me, mm -hmm. you know, because we got this, we got that, and it becomes that type of conversation. But if it's between you and God, exactly. it's, it's a completely uh, uh, different conversation. Yeah, I say like this, right? The signs of a mature believer yeah. is the ability to do the basic things consistently. Yeah. A lot of yeah. times we think a mature believer is the one that can hear from God these big moments, they can hear the audible voice from God. No, no, no. I just want, can you hear, can you just pray every day? Yeah. Can you read your Bible every day? Yeah. Can you help somebody out every day? The mature believer is the person that can do the basic things every single day. And I believe giving and being generous is something we should do. Yeah. And you can practice that in your own way every single day. Uh, uh, Josh, you know, you, you, what you may not know is you know, the, the Seven Fair Squad YouTube channel, a lot of it has to do with not only becoming a first generation cash flow millionaire, but also a, a lot of our YouTube subscribers also come from a faith-based perspective too as well. And we're not trying to shove any faith uh, down people's throats. We want to introduce things so therefore people can understand how faith and finance uh, work together. And it's up to them to find their journey of who they want to call God or who they want to call Savior. Personally, for me, it's, it's, it's Jesus. But I know you're, you're a Sikh. And can you explain to us the Sikh faith and maybe with inside that faith how money was talked about in that faith? Sure. So there's a difference, I guess, on the religious side and the cultural side. In our culture... Um, the Northwest Indian culture, we call it, our state is Punjab, where our family's from. Money is taboo. You don't talk about money. Um, and then in that culture, it's a save heavy culture. I joke that Indian people make a dollar to spend 20 cents. American people make a dollar to spend $2 wow. thanks to credit cards and lines of credit. So it's a save heavy culture traditionally. Religiously, the Sikh religion, you can define it in three tenets. We call it Nam Japo. Van Shako and Kirat Karo, which means remember God, serve others before you serve yourself, and earn an honest living. That is what the religion boils down to. Uh, so remember God, it's, it's a sign of humility. Remember where you come from. Remember yeah. that name. Serve others before you serve yourself. The concept of serving and giving is a, is a major, major component in our religion. Uh, we have a concept called Seva, which means selfless service. It is the fundamental duty of a Sikh to serve others. And then finally, earn an honest living. What that means is it is illegal religiously. You're not supposed to accept a free handout. Wow. You are not, you are supposed to earn every dollar that you earn, every dollar that you have, honestly. And so uh, like, if you go to India, you'll see uh, beggars and slums, but you will not see a Sikh beg for money because in our religion, money must be earned through honest work. Wow. It is very important uh, the way that you earn money that it is earned honestly.